for me, food is mostly not a longevity issue. It's a health span issue. Exercise, sleep quality. I think the reason those things impact multiple age-related diseases simultaneously is precisely because they are impacting the biology of aging. I think the way I would frame it is I, you can only get so far by modifying those lifestyle factors. And so you're not going to see 150, 160-year-old people in good health simply by modifying lifestyle. Exactly. We're not going to extend life very much. You can reduce toxins. You can probably hit your maximum uh, your maximum lifespan. Sort of genetic potential yeah. without additional intervention. Yeah. yeah, and that's lifestyle and all that. Right. But extending it, that's stuff like the gene therapy that I just did. Maybe the guy who said, you know, man will never fly a year before the Wright brothers flew. Maybe he was right. <laughs> I'm going to bet on us extending human lifespan <laughs> because we are. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today, we're going to talk about dogs, specifically how to hack your dog to live a lot longer. Okay, maybe not quite, but maybe. Our guest is Matt Caberlein, who's working on exactly that, extending, radically extending the lifespan of dogs and other pets as well, but starting with dogs, because dogs are better than cats, in case you were wondering. What you're going to hear here is a really fun conversation that mixes human longevity, because Matt is the CEO of Optispan, where they're extending human life, or at least health span as much as they can, by the way. He's one of those guys who still says health span, because he hasn't quite bought in on the fact that we are extending human life, and that's the goal, but I'm going to bring him over on this one. So, you know, that'll be fun. Oh, hey, Matt. Uh, yeah, you didn't hear that, right? <laughs> and, uh, then we're going to also talk about hacking your dog, uh, which is what I already mentioned. And we're going to talk a lot about longevity in your pets because there's such a commonality of humans and dogs. So listen to the whole episode. You'll learn something about how to think about longevity for you and then how to translate it over to your pet. Matt's in town because it's South by Southwest here in Austin, which means it's a madhouse. How bad was the airport coming in? You know, it was pretty crazy, but uh, I made it. So that's all that counts. My, my son is coming in. He's flying by himself. And he's probably never seen an, an airport at that level of chaos. So I'm kind of looking forward to his eyes rolling back in his head as he just sees what true traffic chaos is like. Now, I'm giving a couple of talks at South by this year. Um, you're also giving a talk on what you're doing with pets. Right. Yeah, so there's a panel discussion uh, on, I think it's called something like, could dogs be the key to unraveling human longevity or, or something like that? Well, it's neat. So you're doing the dog aging project. Right. And dogs have this really nice space between, uh, in the longevity research that a lot of my books are based on, it all starts with yeast and roundworms, and then maybe goes to mice. Right. Right. And then... Maybe we have some other data somewhere or another, and then we start using it with humans using aging clocks. That's what we do today, you're right. Yeah, and aging clocks are pretty useful because before that, we couldn't do anything. Right. There's still some like Luddite skeptic people. Um, like, <laughs> like me? Well, no, like, like Peter Atia, who, who says aging clocks aren't scientific. I'm like, I want to see Steve Horvath in a wrestling match with um, with. Peter Atia. Well, I know both of those guys, and I'm pretty sure I know who would win well, the Peter, wrestling Well, Peter would win, but that, <laughs> that's because he's a meathead, not a longevity scientist, is my point here. So, sorry, Peter, you need to revisit what is scientific, and maybe less time in the gym, more time in the labs, just saying. So, I, I actually want to push back on that a little bit. Peter is a friend of mine, but also one of the people I... Think, I've been on stage with him. He's not uh, a bad guy, uh, among, but he, among he's the, not a believer in longevity. No, I would disagree with that. So look, I think I think Peter has strongly held opinions like all of us do. That are that are uh, wrong. Yeah. Those. Uh, most of the time he's right. And I would say among oh, a lot on, on statins and vaccines. A lot among oh. a lot of the <laughs> Uh, influencers in this space. I think Peter does a good job of doing his homework. And, and I think there is some nuance here. I, I am, am certainly not going to try to speak for Peter, but here's the way I would frame the aging clocks. There you go. I think they are very useful research tools. Yeah. I think that um, the utility of the, the aging clocks in the consumer space is pretty questionable in my mind. And part of that is because we really don't have much data on how precise or reproducible these clocks are when sold by companies to consumers. And so I actually have a lot of concern 
that these clocks are being misused and abused in the con consumer space. Interesting. I also think that um, it's important to recognize that that all of the clocks that are currently in use are really only measuring one, sometimes two small aspects of biological aging. We don't really know, you know, to what extent are they capturing the entire biological aging process. Nothing does right now. And yeah. It, we we do know that the aging clocks and um, Steve Horvath's interpretation of it is the first one, but there's about a dozen others. They can predict when you're going to die within about 10 years pretty reliably. I think it depends on what you mean by pretty reliably. I can look at somebody and predict pretty reliably whether they're going to die in 10 years. Um, that's a good point. I would have to look at, I don't know if they compared it. <laughs> I've had that, this conversation so. with Steve, so I, so it, I kind it, of know how the math it, plays it, out. It, they're better than just yeah. looking at somebody. Mm -hmm. They're honestly not that great. They're better than telomeres. <laughs> yes, but he, actually, Ed, that's true. But the question is, is that because we don't have the tools yet to precisely measure individual telomere lengths? I actually think this is a super interesting question. It's way off, way off on a tangent, but, wow. but I think it is um, really something we don't, we don't know at this point, whether the epigenetics, which is what Steve's clock is based on, those are nice because we have huge dimensionality. There uh -huh. are tens of thousands of epigenetic marks we can measure, and we can do it very precisely. That's very different than the telomeres, where we only have, you know, 46 or so things right. we can measure, and we can't do it very precisely. So maybe telomeres actually are a pretty good clock if we could measure them. I, I think we just don't know. That. I actually don't believe that. I'm just saying we don't know the answer at this it, point. It's true that we're discovering a lot, and we know more now than we did. And <laughs> Nobody could argue with that. <laughs> every 72 days, the amount of info we have about biology doubles right yeah. now. So it, it's this golden age of longevity research. Yeah. And I've seen telomere numbers swing by 20 years in one week. That's either because of lab errors or because your blood is a terrible place well, to get that's, telomeres. Well, I think that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. The tissue type that you're measuring and blood, of course, is, is a complex yeah. right, set, of set of cell types that you're actually measuring. So yeah, they're, they're, and, but this goes back to my point earlier, which is that I think that while these things can be quite useful in a research setting because of a lot of those uncertainties about what we're actually measuring, yeah. their utility in the real world, for now, I think is, is unclear. But I'm super enthusiastic that we're going to get there in probably the not too distant future. I, I would say that, that aging clocks are extremely scientific and early days. Fair. Right. And so the, the idea that, well, there's no way we're going to extend human life and there's no way to measure how old you are biologically, which is kind of a summation of uh, Peter's work, which is why I'm like, let's go to the A4M. Let's go to the people who are actually looking at extending life with something besides exercise and statins. Because, well, I, I think those have been tried for a while and no one's living longer. That's, that's why I'm... But I you believe in exercise. Well... <laughs> 20 minutes tell by looking at you. 20 minutes a week of exercise is all I do. Hmm. And I do it with AI and that upgrade labs. I, I believe that most people weigh over exercise, uh, including Peter, right? Because it, it turns out it's not the area under the curve, it's the slope of the curve up, and most importantly, the slope of the curve down, and then the nutrient and protein availability. So I'm gonna push back a little bit and suggest By the way, that Peter, Peter could kick my ass <laughs> just to be really clear. <laughs> most people are don't don't overexercise. Maybe Amen. people in the optimization world overexercise. People who exercise every day usually overexercise and almost everyone doesn't move enough. Right? So there's a lot going on there. Yeah. And it's funny because you know we're we're here to talk about dogs, but <laughs> we're talking about humans because I think dogs are the bridge between the research from mice and yeast and the little creatures, and hey, I, if they can live longer, there's pretty good evidence that some of that stuff will help us, but it doesn't always. Right. Uh, and so, well, what's in the middle? Well, dogs are a lot closer to people than they are yeast, but they're still pretty far away. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so first of all, I love the way you sort of frame that because, because my career path has followed that trajectory. I started in yeast as a graduate student then worked in nematode worms as a postdoc. There you and go. when I started my own lab, we started doing stuff in mice because I believed that there were aspects of aging biology that were in fact shared across this broad evolutionary distance. Turns out that's right. Um, and then about 10 years ago, it occurred to me that, as you suggested, dogs are this really powerful bridge between the laboratory studies and humans. Not only because they're closer to humans um, in a biological sense, but there's this huge environmental component that mm -hmm. we can't or choose not to study in the laboratory that's really important for human aging. 
Um, and because dogs share so much of the human environment, at least companion dogs or pet dogs do, we can capture that environmental component and really understand you know, not only what are the most important genetic factors that influence longevity, but what are the most important environmental factors. And then there's this huge other piece, which is what I'm most interested in, is we can actually test whether interventions affect lifespan and health span metrics in dogs, which would be great for giving us confidence about people, but I'm a dog person. So what I really care about is making my dog and other people's dogs live longer, healthier lives. The number of people in the longevity enthusiast field, whether you work in the field or you're just someone like me who's, who's spent you know, decades, I guess I do work in the field, come to think of it, but I didn't used to. Uh, so uh, the number of us who have pets who are not on longevity regimens is very low. All of us know, huh, the things that work for me, like red lights, and we know what it does with mitochondria and cell folding and all that stuff. Maybe I should shine it at the dog when the dog hurts and then the dog stops hurting and it probably affects longevity, and maybe not feeding them the pet equivalent of chicken nuggets will also affect longevity, right? right? So we all kind of do that, uh, whereas uh, it's still very common. People go to the, the store and they buy big things of, of pet food that are made out of euthanized dogs. You're like, maybe your dog shouldn't eat that. Like, there's some really bad stuff happening. I mean, there's some really... Uh interesting and in many ways unfortunate parallels between you know what most human beings eat or at least the quality of the diet that most human beings eat and the quality of the diet that most human beings give to their companion animals and there's complicated reasons for that obviously but um you know i think you're right i think the people who are on this path towards improving their own health span trajectory often recognize that the same thing is true for their pets and take a healthier approach to their pets so you're a you're a PhD, yeah, and uh, actually a very well studied one because you well I guess published 250 studies, something like that. You founded <laughs> research centers, and you're in the American Aging Association, and so you talk like the best PhD ever. But I think what I heard you say in that was that humans <laughs> and dogs shouldn't eat kibble. Did I get that right? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, certainly I think humans probably should not eat kibble. Um, I think again the the quality of the food. Uh, itself, right, is in, in the general food supply is really problematic, both for yeah. dogs and for people. Uh, yeah. So we've, we've got to fix food. And for me, food is mostly not a longevity issue. It's a health span issue. I don't know. Um, I, I understand that perspective. I would say I'm, I'm a little bit less certain. I um, certainly believe to some extent that the reason quality diet exercise, appropriate amount of exercise, right. whatever that is. I think we're still figuring that out. Yeah. Exercise, sleep quality. I think the reason those things impact multiple age-related diseases simultaneously is precisely because they are impacting the biology of aging. I think the way I would frame it is I, you can only get so far by modifying those lifestyle factors. And so you're not going to see 150, 160-year-old people in good health simply by modifying lifestyle. Exactly. We're not going to extend life very much. You can reduce toxins. You can probably hit your maximum, uh, your maximum lifespan. Sort of genetic potential yeah. without additional intervention. Yeah. yeah, and that's lifestyle and all that. Right. Uh, but extending it, that's stuff like the gene therapy that I just did. Um, and I, I maybe am, we'll see. <laughs> or, well, we'll see. Of course, right? And and for all of all of history, it's always been a we'll see for all the things yeah. we're doing on things like that. Uh, we just have better tools now to do it. And hey, maybe maybe the guy who said, you know, man will never fly a year before the Wright brothers flew, maybe he was right. <laughs> I'm going to bet on us extending human lifespan <laughs> because we are. Like that, I mean, you talk. I, I have no doubt. You, that you see all the research being done. I have no doubt that it's possible, right? Of course. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the questions in my mind more uh, revolve around how long is it going to take before we can actually demonstrate that these things work. And this is where, going back to the aging clocks, I think once the aging clocks evolve to the point where there's uh, confidence that they are, in fact, predicting future mortality, future disease risk with high precision, then you have a real opportunity. You, it's still not going to be proof until you actually see somebody live that long, but you can be pretty darn confident that these things are having the effect that you wanted them to have. Then the last question is, is there some long-term consequence that we don't know about that's going to offset that, right? Because it only takes only takes one mortality event to keep you from living a long time. So that's an unknown, and you know we're not going to know until we get there. 
One of my big longevity strategies is to drive a heavy vehicle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Avoid dying, I think, is rule number one of longevity. Yeah. You use physics. <laughs> Necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. If you're in the Prius, I want to be in the Suburban. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, not to say that I think I'm more important than you. I'm just allocating my resources in a way where physics protects me. Um, and it, it's something I think is, is not looked at enough in, in the field of longevity is just, you know, don't fall down and break yourself. Don't blow out your spine yeah. on a, you know, hitting a new PR when you're 60. It's probably not worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we kind of think about, you know, four movements uh, at OptusMan as we're, we're trying to, to communicate some of these ideas to people. And one of them is staying alive, right? You got to you got to avoid risky behaviors and you know it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of luck there's a lot of probability in life but you can change the probabilities in your favor like you're saying by taking steps to reduce your likelihood of dying if you had to pick one thing not exercising or eating just the worst possible fast food diet for the rest of your life which one would you pick i would Oh God! If you want to exercise, you have to I don't think food. I could eat the worst fast food diet. I'd have to choose not exercising. You, you, you that would choose. kind of suck for me, yeah. but but I could, yeah. I I mean, again, as somebody who ate a pretty crappy diet, like many people, for a big chunk yeah, of my life, I think we're about the same age. Now yeah. that I'm out of that world, like I, it just is repulsive to me to think about going back to it. I will never go back to eating food that makes me feel crappy, yeah. and I am willing to die on that. And this is what the regulators who think we're going to live on crickets and grain, I can't live on that. And I won't. And I'll eat a politician before I'll eat a cricket. And, and I'm just okay with that. All right? They're made out of meat. Yeah, It's not, not my ideal yeah. source of meat, but... <laughs> I, I actually think this is pretty interesting because I've talked to a fair number of other people who kind of share that, uh, not so much about eating politicians, but the, the sort of revulsion at the idea of, of going back to this standard American diet, right? And I, it's hard sometimes for people who aren't already in this place to understand that, but I think it's just worth emphasizing, right? It's really about building habits. And if you can get out of the, the habits that you're in, that society and culture pushes you towards and get to a better place in terms of the quality of your diet, you will, <laughs> I, I can almost guarantee you will, uh, you will agree that, that there's just no way you want to go back to that once you get out of it. And also, it's not the same for everyone. This right? is true. Absolutely. There are people who just feel great on chicken. I am a beef guy and sure. I've tested well, everything. I would eat gravel if I could, but beef is what works for me. And you try and take away my beef with a regulatory thing. It's, it's like, no, you've sure. taken away my oxygen. <laughs> we, are, we are not, not going to be okay with this. So here's the way I think about it. I think there are multiple uh, types of high quality diet. There is not a one size fits all. I completely agree with that. And I think that, that um, but I also think that there is a, a high quality diet that can fit almost everybody. So in other words, um, I, I don't believe that there, that there are people who will just thrive, or if there are, they are the way outliers who will just thrive on, on garbage. And you know, there are some, I, I know people who do, at least for a while. And I also yeah. know a couple people who thrive on a vegan diet. It's just their kids and their grandkids who are paying for it because it matters. In fact, if you look at you know, the health of vegan offspring and things like that, it, it's not pretty. The placental health... Uh, so you might get away with it, but you're actually paying for it in future generations. It, it's a it's a big experiment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm I'm less opinionated about vegan diet. I'm not Sorry. a vegan, but uh, I don't. I'm certainly not a vegan basher. I was a devout <laughs> vegan for a couple of years, and yeah. it trashed my health yeah. like in a big way. I'm a food supporter. I absolutely love the vegan philosophy. Like, you want to take care of your health. You want to take care of the planet. And you want to reduce um, animal suffering and death. The problem is the vegan diet doesn't do any of those three things. Yeah, and I believed it did. So yeah, I, and I, I think the way I sort of also think about this, but I struggle a lot with the nutrition literature. I mean, honestly, I mean, nutri look, these are these are good scientists trying trying to do good science, but it's really hard to do high quality. Uh, definitive science in human nutrition. Oh, yeah. And so I really struggle with a lot of the epidemiology. And so I personally, you know, I'm very slow to come to strong conclusions about what is the optimal diet, what isn't, and, and yeah. what are the long-term consequences to some of these dietary, different dietary approaches people take. I think, you know, again, the way, the way I sort of uh, align is there are some things that we can be almost certain are not good to have in your diet, right? Highly processed foods, a lot of simple sugars, right? Uh, low, low quality fats, 
So I think those are the things that that most people should agree. If they're knowledgeable, you want to get out of your diet. And, and all the flavorings and coloring. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that, yeah. And those are bad for dogs. They're bad for people. Uh, and from there, you know, what, what plant toxins can your body tolerate versus mine? You know, 28% of rheumatoid arthritis is caused by nightshades if you have the genetics. But for, if you don't have the genetics, yeah. you can eat them all day long. Right? And, so, and this really actually ties in in an interesting way to the biology of aging, because I think a lot of what's driving that is our own um, individual immune response, yes. right? So the, the reaction of the immune system to molecules that we're getting in our diet and other places in the environment yeah. that drive chronic inflammation. Some people are just much more prone to that sort of hyper-inflammatory state. And, and that leads to a lot of the conditions that you're talking about. I'm certainly one of those, you know, being 300 pounds and all the, the health stuff I've gone through when I was younger. So uh, I recognize I c I'm coming from behind in my goal to live to at least 180. I'm willing to die trying, fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to do 50% well, better than Well, the nice thing best. is, you know, this is pretty cool. One of the things that has emerged from the literature in my academic career is that it doesn't seem like there's a point where it's too late unless you've got a disease where the pathology of the disease has sort of outpaced the biology of aging. So we now know, and we didn't know this when I started, but now we know you can start intervening in middle age and still get pretty big effects on both longevity and health span. It's funny, if you start before pregnancy, the three months before your mother was pregnant with you and you have a really healthy pregnancy, yeah. Um, you get the most leverage on longevity. That's all the epigenetic effects, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that was what my first book was on fertility and what do you do before you get pregnant. And then it's sort of, you get less and less leverage the longer you wait to do longevity interventions. I'm just like in my 20s, I learned from people in their 80s all this longevity stuff in, in Palo Alto. Yeah, I wonder though, because, yeah. you know, this is that's, that's sort of the uh, mindset I think people had before 2009, when the first study on rapamycin in mm -hmm. mice was done, where they kind of accidentally started the treatment in a 60-year-old equivalent mouse. But I think what we've learned is that at least with some interventions, you can get most of the benefit even starting late in life. But with so, some of them, you can. Yeah. And, and I think as these tools to kind of reset the epigenome evolve, we might actually be able to get closer to that sort of initial epigenetic state that you were talking and about. It may not even matter at a certain point. In the, the world that I see coming, uh, you'll be able to edit your mitochondrial DNA so it so it more closely works with your nuclear DNA, and these are all editable settings in your hardware. The biggest challenge will be if you make too big of a change is just causing systems integration to work between all the different systems yeah, in the body. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I don't know how far. I mean, again, I agree. Theoretically, that's that's all possible. I think the challenge that I see, and this is where, you know, it'll be interesting to see how effective the sort of evolution of AI tools is at, yeah. at, at, at disentangling the complexity of the biology. Uh, look, I'm in this field deep, yeah. and I recognize how little we actually understand. <laughs> and so, half, of, uh, <laughs> half what we think we know is just wrong, and the AI yeah. believes it. That's, that's one of so the So it'll be interesting to see, but I do agree, all of that's, that's, on, that's on the table. I just don't know how long it's going to take to get there. So I have a pretty good track record of you know, seeing things before they happen. I, I'm the first guy to sell anything over the internet before e-commerce had a name. It was a t-shirt that said, Caffeine, my drug of choice. And I sold it out <laughs> in my dorm room. It was in the Miami Herald. And like the first data center companies, I, I've, I've picked reliably. I also have a track record of thinking it's going to happen before it does. But now I'm wise because I have some age on me now. Mm -hmm. So I would have said, oh, it's, it'll be three years before we get there if I was 20. I'm going to say <laughs> 10 years before we get there, mostly because of advances yeah. in AI, subject to, uh, to two things. One, that governments don't succeed in in basically destroying our access to these things or to breaking AI. I don't think they can, um, but they might. Uh, and two, that a comet doesn't hit the planet. But otherwise, I'm pretty confident on it because we have a hard time conceptualizing this is even beyond exponential rates of growth yeah. in AI. So I, I think we're going to get there. As long as we train the AI to care about it, then it'll, it'll do it. But if we train the AI to be really good at killing people, it might not care much about making us live longer. So this is... Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. We should, we should sit down and, and come yeah. up with a bet about like, what are the oh actual... God. What do we actually want to bet on? I'm less optimistic, but in part that's because... And again, this is where the exponential yeah. equation can fool you. But I look back at where we were 10 years ago in this field, and I don't see 10 years from now as getting to that.
that point. So we'll see. Oh, not everyone will get there. Well, right? the first couple of people will get there in oh, 10 years. Well, yes, there may be people who are, there's already people who are editing their genome. So sure. <laughs> it's be like, I mean, I've had the gene therapy, but it wasn't my, my uh, inheritable genome. But which gene therapy? I did the Folistatin gene okay. therapy yeah. uh, with yeah. mini circles, uh, just plasmid level stuff. And I, I'm impressed and I'll, I'll be in the first trial for clothing. The biology is real. I mean, there's no question about yeah, it. Yeah. it. It works, right? And now the fact that, you know, nine years comes off your aging clock for that, you can say, well, that doesn't really matter very much. I'm like, yeah, but the bone density increase in the uh, increase in muscle and the decrease in fat works. Yeah, it's super intriguing. I, I'm, I, that's one of the spaces I'm watching pretty closely. It's funny because, you know, in, in your day job, you're at OptiSpan, you're working on extending you know, human lifespan for high-end clients. And then, in your your night job, you're saying, "Well, let's do the same thing for dogs." Yeah, although let me let me clarify. So it's not for high end clients oh, only, what, right? What is so, I, I mean, I don't know. I, so what I would say is our mission at OptiSpan is really to enable the transition from reactive disease care to proactive health care for as many people as possible, right? I like it. So, and I think there are lots of ways you can do that. There are lots of smart people working on this, um, but I think we have an opportunity to contribute. And so we're really looking right now at two lanes. One is sort of high end concierge medicine, because that's the place where you can do the most expensive, most sophisticated sort of approaches here. But we're also working in the corporate wellness space and trying to say, what can we do in this proactive science-based healthcare for you know, $1,500, $2,000 a year, something employers might be willing to put towards employee health, recruitment, retention, things like that. So we really are trying to democratize this as much as possible, recognizing that as a for-profit company, you know, you also have to be able to make revenue. Uh, absolutely. If you run a business that doesn't make any money ever, uh, it's probably not a very good business, un unless you're Amazon or, or Tesla. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> Sometimes you can have external funding, but I'm with you. Uh, I believe that the best way you can change the world is as an entrepreneur, not as a donor, right? And I also have donated meaningful amounts of money to projects I believe in. But end of the day, if the money makes more money to right. support the cause, you now start the flywheel. You've got a movement yeah. versus you've got a one-time flash. People will throw the word superfood around like it means something, and they'll apply it to almost anything. I'm waiting to see superfood kibble for humans, but there are real superfoods. And there's one that I've been researching for years with so many health benefits, you almost wouldn't believe it. I first started using it for gut health, and then I figured out that it supports metabolism, hair growth, healthy skin, immunity, and even athletic performance. I'm talking about colostrum. Colostrum is the first nutrition we receive in life and has all the essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and grow. To get those nutrients, it's important to properly source your colostrum. And that's why I use Armra Colostrum. Armra is a bovine colostrum concentrate that's natural, sustainable, and third-party tested for purity and efficacy. Armra's process preserves the integrity of 400 bioactive nutrients. Since I started taking Armra Colostrum, I've noticed a difference in my energy, my fitness, uh, my skin, my gut, especially when I travel. And I like it that I can take one or two or three scoops and I could just take it in my mouth or I can drink it with water and it tastes mild and it really does change the state of my body. It's a potent anti-aging substance. Go to tryarmra.com, T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A.com. Use code Dave. They'll give you a 15% off your first order. People are talking about this a lot online. I've been a fan of colostrum for years. I just couldn't find one that consistently worked. Armra really makes me happy because it does. We've talked about human aging a little bit here, and there's a lot we don't know, and we're making great progress. Now, we also know small dogs live longer than big dogs. Does this mean that small humans live longer than big humans? Yeah, actually, there's some evidence to support that. So this is something where people uh, have a lot of confusion. There's this idea that um, large animals live longer than small animals. And that's true if you look across species. So if you look across the animal kingdom, larger animals do, in fact, live longer than small animals. Like but elephants and whales, exactly, right? Yeah, but when you look within a species, in general, at least in mammals, smaller individuals tend to live longer than larger individuals. And that's true in people. It's complicated in people by the fact that there is a social component to being tall. And so you have to kind of take that into consideration. Dogs are interesting because the body size difference is so much bigger 
when you look across the dog species, that we can really see that difference in aging rate. I've had six dachshunds over the course of my life, uh, including when I was a kid. And all of them lived 15, 16, 17 years old. Uh, But the last two were when I knew the most about nutrition and longevity. And I applied those things. Uh, Merlin, uh, who was uh, the last dog that I had, um, passed away when he was 15 and a half or something. But he got a krill oil every day. And he got a little bit of collagen. And he ate mostly raw grass-fed beef and some egg yolks on occasion and um, very small amounts of vegetable matter. And when he was young, I gave him things like the barf diet, you know, bones and raw food. And I don't think dogs are supposed to eat huge amounts of celery and carrots. It didn't work so well. But I ended up with a dog that just didn't have pain in his body, um, didn't have a lot of the debilitating things, no lipomas and good fur. And right. it was pretty incredible, actually. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think this goes back a little bit to what we touched on earlier about how a lot of the components of the diet for dogs as well are pro-inflammatory. In other words, they're not things that the canine body has evolved to see. So there's an immune response against some of these factors, and that gives you this chronic inflammatory state, which drives a lot of diseases of aging, a lot of the pain that, that you mentioned. One of the things that's challenging in dogs is there's much less data on the long-term effects of different diet yeah. in dogs. So there's a lot of um, strong opinions out there sure. and not a lot of good data. So one of the things we want to do at the Dog Aging Project is actually collect that data so we can actually start to understand and be able to draw strong conclusions that, yes, in fact, a particular diet does seem to be associated with much longer health span, there's that word, and lifespan. Well, we all want health span. So it's a it's a great goal. It's just not a big goal. I, I want health span twice as long. Yeah, that's well, a big goal. I agree. So I hear what you're saying. Here's the way I would think about it. And this is easier to talk about in humans than it is in dogs, again, because we have the data. At an individual level, I agree completely. At a population level, um, health span in the United States, States sucks, right? Oh, yeah. So 60% of people have a chronic disease. Average lifespan in the United States is 38.1 years. That means that if you define health span as the period of life without a chronic disease or disability, health span ends for most people before they're 38 years old. Life expectancy is in the mid 70s. So if we could, if we could push that health span curve out, that's a big deal at the population. It's just, it's a very easy goal. It's it's mostly (laughs) it's easy to talk about. (laughs) It's it's harder to accomplish. (laughs) Behavior change. We don't need to know more to do that. We just need to do more to do that. You can move it out 20 years with what we know today. I I think that's true. I think it's more than behavior change, though. I think there's policy factors. There's all sorts of other stuff that goes into that. But I hear what you're saying. You have to clean out the big food agencies that control the government agencies that tell us what to eat. That might be part of it. And maybe change some tax incentives, but those are all ultimately behavioral It's things. doable. Yeah. And it's not like we have to crack the atom in order <laughs> to do this. <laughs> this is true. Right. And what we're looking to do in the doubling of human lifespan yeah. is the equivalent of yeah. a Manhattan Project level undertaking. I agree. I mean, I, look, the, the best that people have been able to do in a mouse beyond genetic intervention through development is about 60% increase in lifespan. So we've still got a long ways to go. But what about the 95% from carbon 60? Right. So you have to, um, you have to be careful about short-lived controls. So percent change is numerator over denominator. Yep. If your denominator is much smaller than it should be, your percent change gets oh. uh, dramatically overinflated. So, so then you're saying you get mice that are that are engineered to die in 90 days, you make or, them live 180? Or, 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 or because of poor exper- experimental conditions, sure. they were exposed to toxins or pathogens or whatever that shortened their lifespan. So I guess I should reframe that. The, 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 the largest effect that has been reproducible in a quality experiment is about 60%. Okay, there you go. I, I, I like that. And it's funny, my 180 number, we have humans who are 120. I just want to do 50%. Hey, I number. think that would be, that's a fantastic goal. Yeah, that's, that's where 180 comes from for me. And I know I might not make it, but I don't think it's a crazy goal. I think it's a big goal, right? I and, would agree. Yeah. And that's and that's why I, I keep talking about it. It's so many people are like, that's crazy. I'm like, I don't think it is. It might not happen in my life, but I'm gonna bet on it. Right. And what else am I gonna do with all this time? <laughs> all right. And it's fun to talk about, right? It, it totally is. One of my questions about dogs is, and you're trying to control what they eat and all this sort of stuff. I have taken my dogs to a dog park. They eat poop. <laughs> 
<laughs> How do you control for poop intake? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you believe it or not, that is one of the questions on the survey. So the Dog Aging Project Longitudinal Study actually uh, has a, uh, a a very comprehensive survey tool that we use to collect a lot of data about the dog's mm -hmm. environment, health history. So indeed, at least one of the questions, there may be more than one, uh, addresses whether or not your dog consumes feces. Um, also, also asks about time spent at the dog park, time with other animals. So, so we really do try to capture that. It's not quantitative. We don't ask how much feces does your dog consume. But you have to get a but, scale. But believe it or not, there are. I mean, there are. There are. You. I'm sure you know this, right? There are certain dogs that absolutely love to eat poop from other dogs, and yeah. then there are other dogs that won't touch it. They might yeah. eat rocks or something, right? Yeah. So there's a genetic predisposition here as well. Is there a certain breed that's more of a poop eater? Because I don't Probably, ever, but I, 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 I don't, don't, I don't a, know the answer. I don't want a poop eater breed. Sorry. Yeah, we had a, a Kazon, or some people call them Keyshounds, that um, was a poop eater. And boy, you had to watch her like a hawk. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, don't kiss me. Don't kiss me. <laughs> oh, and, and Kazons <laughs> love to kiss you as well. Yeah, it's a bad mix. <laughs> the, the other thing that's a great crossover is that people who own dogs live longer than people who don't. Is that from emotional support, energetic support, or like some bacterial thing it's in the microbiome? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, there could certainly be biological, like, like, like you're talking about the microbiome, those yeah. kind of biological interactions. My intuition is that it really more is... Uh, comes from the sort of connection that a lot of people get from their dogs. So we all we all know that that human connection is really important for happiness, uh, um, and that people who have strong human connection also tend to live longer. And I absolutely believe that many people can get at least some of that connection from their companion animals. There's also really good data that um, interacting with a dog uh, or a cat believe it or not, uh, can have impacts on the physiology of the person in terms of reducing stress hormones, reducing anxiety. So that certainly could play a role as well. So you don't think that the toxoplasmosis from cat owners that causes the crazy cat lady thing is real? Again, there's probably a genetic predisposition there. <laughs> that was the best PhD answer ever. <laughs> that was like the worst loaded question I've ever asked a guest. And you dodged it like a pro. So Matt, congratulations. The, the other difference between dogs and cats is that if you were to pass away unexpectedly, the dog will sit next to you and starve to death guarding you, and the cat will eat your eyeballs. Just saying. I, I have no direct experience with that. I mean, I, I, like, I, I, I like cats. I just, you know, if I had a choice, I would pick the dog. So, so guys, I, I know that if you have a cat right now... You're just really trying hard to go after the cat. Maybe we can do a crossover study with vegans. What do you think of vegan cat food and vegan dog food for longevity? Personally, I wouldn't use that. as a as a PhD who knows. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't personally feed that to my dog. Yeah. Um, what about feeding people food to dogs? It depends on the people food, right? <laughs> so you know, feeding Big Macs and fries to your dog on a regular basis probably a bad idea. So, so I go back to my childhood. We didn't know much. In fact, you know, we were in the days of get rid of butter and use squeeze margarine, uh, bran muffins, and yeah. it's fine to go get a Big Mac, and. We would boil hot dogs and just boil them and make hot dogs at home. And we would give the hot dog water to the dogs hmm. and they would drink it until they were so bloated, like little stuffed sausages. Yeah. You, you could like flick their sides and they would make weird, you know, watery sounds. And I look back and like, that was the worst thing I ever could have done to my, my poor dogs. Uh, but like, well, they like it and it's food and I'm willing to eat it. And I was just entirely ignorant of the effect of the food on my biology, which was jazz. Sure, right. And on the dogs. Absolutely. But those dogs still live 17 years. They had a bunch of lipomas and like their final couple of years maybe weren't that comfortable compared to later in life. But it seems like food quality in humans from you know, 25 years ago and now there's something different that maybe is worse for pets and worse for humans. Do you think there's been a change? Well, there's clearly been a change. I think um, there's no question that the composition uh, that the typical person is eating in their diet is obesogenic, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's just that's just using a fancy word to say something we all know, right? Which is that what people are eating now drive us towards obesity. Yeah. And all you have to do is look at pictures from 30, 40 years ago of people, and this is obvious. Yeah. So exactly what those mechanisms are, I think we're starting to learn. I think there's been a lot of engineering of the food to um, get people to eat it faster, to get people to eat it mo eat more, and I and whether and that's intentional, like that is intentional engineering. I understand why the food companies did it, 
But then there's this, this additional factor there, which I, I don't know whether it was intentional or not, that it's not satiating. So then people are hungry again. Right. So they eat faster and eat more. And there's this cycle that drives obesity. So absolutely, there have been changes. Okay. I, I think that's a big part of it too. There are some compounds that, uh, that I've written about that a lot, in the, a lot of people in the longevity field are paying attention to, like rapamycin. Can you talk about rapamycin? What is it and should we give it to our dogs? Right. So rapamycin is a uh, small molecule that was found on Easter Island, which also goes by the name Rapa Nui. That's where the drug gets its name. Yep. It's actually produced by bacteria there in the soil. And um, rapamycin has this super cool backstory. So if anybody's interested, oh, yeah. you, can, you can Google it and, and find it. Find out about Tim, rapamycin. Tim Ferriss went to the island to go discover it or Along something. Along with your buddy, Peter Atia. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my, my real buddy, Peter Atia. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've, been, Actually, I've been on stage at A4M with Peter. Yeah. It's, just, it's just weird to have someone on stage saying you can't extend human life. I'm like, what is wrong with that? <laughs> this is my, one of my bucket list items is to, to get to, uh, to Rapa Nui and see where it all started. But regardless, that's where rapamycin yep. was first discovered. And um, it was initially tr attempted to be developed as an antifungal, anti-cancer agent, but the way it actually was developed clinically was for organ transplant patients mm. because it is a, a potent uh, uh, anti-inflammatory and uh, what people call anti-proliferative drug. In other words, it slows down the cell cycle. And so in an organ transplant patient who's got a transplanted organ, you want to target the immune system to prevent it from reacting to that organ. So Correct. it was clinically approved as an organ uh, transplant drug, and it's called an immunosuppressant, and that's how it's been used clinically. Um, so there's a lot of data in human use there, but I think we have to recognize those are in people who, there's a reason why they had an organ transplant. They're taking high doses of rapamycin, and they're taking a bunch of other true immunosuppressants. So it does have some side effects in that context, um, but it sort of got a bad reputation clinically because of how it was used and developed. Now, in parallel, really around the 2000, early 2000s, mm -hmm. several labs independently discovered that you could treat yeast, worms, flies, like we were talking about, with rapamycin and increase lifespan. And so people started studying what's the mechanism there. And it turns out rapamycin is an inhibitor of a protein called mTOR, yep. mechanistic target of rapamycin. Um, and we now know from studies over the last 20 years that mTOR is, if not the most potent, one of the most potent knobs that we can turn to regulate the rate of aging in laboratory animals. And, and as we alluded to earlier, there was a study, I think that really changed the game for rapamycin in the longevity field in 2009 from the interventions testing program where they showed that you could start treating mice at 20 months of age, which is about the mouse equivalent of a 60 year old person with rapamycin, yep. still get significant effects on lifespan. And then since then, lots of labs have shown, not only can you increase lifespan when you start treatment in middle age, but you can actually improve pretty much every metric of aging that people look at in pretty much every tissue and organ where people study it. So it really seems as though rapamycin um, modifies the biology of aging uh, in a way that can increase both lifespan and health span, again, at least in laboratory animals, and you can get the benefits starting in middle age. mTOR is an interesting compound uh, because of that research back in 2009 when I first started the biohacking movement and uh, I wrote one of my early posts was how to triple down on mTOR mm -hmm. because it works. I mean, you're a PhD. You can say if any of this is wrong, but the picture I have in my head from reading all the papers is that it kind of works like a spring. You want to suppress it, but when the more you suppress it, the more it's going to spike when you unsuppress it. So the three big things I could find back then that were going to suppress mTOR temporarily were fasting, coffee, and weight-bearing exercise. So, I'm, well, that's funny. Drink coffee during the fast, <laughs> lift at the end of the fast, and then eat a meal with protein and carbs because carbs raise mTOR like 10 times more than protein, right? Insul insulogenic carbs. Right. So I actually think this is where there's a lot of confusion out there. So most people would say it's the protein that I think it's the carbs. Do you think it's the carbs? Because I don't actually, I don't know the answer to okay. that, right? And I think it depends on where you look is the honest, honest okay. answer. I think it depends on the tissue that you're looking in. But it is absolutely massively oversimplistic to say that it's that it's only amino acids that activate mTOR. But you'll see, you'll see that all the time. It's something that I'll say, I, I probably went 50% too far in that direction in my longevity book. Because I wrote about you know 0.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And there's a bunch of studies that support that. 
Um, but most of them are because of methionine and tryptophan and other things that increase mTOR. But if you want to look good, you need mTOR because that's how muscles right. build. And you don't want sarcopenia and you don't want bone loss. And right. I have absurdly dense bones and you know, a, a relatively high amount of skeletal muscle mass uh, when I look at all my quantified stuff. So if I drop my mTOR too much, right. the only thing I could eat would be fat because carbs raise it. And protein raises it from animals, but I could eat brown rice protein full of arsenic and stuff, but its biological availability is so low, I need twice as much of it. So I'd be eating industrial processed uh, plant proteins, huge amounts of them, farting all the time and having all the... Yeah. Like, th there's, there's no way to There's a quality of life here. issue there, too. It, yeah. It's like you can't do it. So what? where did you end up on the protein so again, mTOR? I, I, so again, so, so I think those are actually two different questions. Okay. Because I think mTOR, first of all, you... I'm not convinced that that getting mTOR as low as you possibly can is it's the bad. right answer, it's right? Bad. There's an optimum to everything. But I also think that um, we need to recognize that, that mTOR cycles, like many other molecules in our body in terms of activity, uh -huh. and there are natural cycles of, of mTOR activity that are different in different tissues, different organs, and the optimal level of mTOR is probably going to be different in different tissues and organs. You talked about muscle. We know that in order to build new muscle, you need to activate mTOR. Right, So the optimal level of mTOR in your skeletal muscle may be different than the optimal level of mTOR in your kidney or your brain. Mm -hmm. And we just don't know. I think this is, gets back to how little we know. So here's the way I think about it. I think we know dietary protein. Again, this is challenging because it depends on what else you eat. It depends on what kind but, of dietary protein. Yeah, absolutely. But I think um, if, if you look at people who are eating a high-quality diet, I think in general, this is my perspective of the literature as it exists now, a higher relative amount of dietary protein in combination with resistance training is a very good strategy yes. for maintaining and growing muscle mass as you get older and bone densities. I'm glad you actually mentioned yeah. that because a lot of people only think about muscle. But if your bones are crap, it's not going to matter how much yeah. muscle you've got. So I think this is actually really, uh, really important. And, and I worry that this, again, you get some people out there who simplistically think about mTOR and they're like, yeah. well, just don't eat any protein. Low protein is good. And I, I worry we're misleading people. It's destructive to, to be on low protein. Hey, biohacker. So you've heard of stem cells, you know, they're powerful and maybe you wonder about stem cell therapy, but the process seems kind of intense because it is. Well, there's a new company called stem regen that I've been working with. The founder Christian Drapeau is a stem cell scientist. He's traveled the world in search of unknown plant extracts that can stimulate the release of your body's own stem cells right from your bone marrow. His discoveries led to an amazing breakthrough in stem cell therapy. Stem Regen is the world's first stem cell enhancer. Just two capsules will release 10 million of your own stem cells into circulation. Those stem cells migrate throughout your body and help your body naturally repair and renew itself. This is a new powerful and very cost-effective way to get the benefits of stem cells without having to hop on an airplane. And how about 20% off now? Go to stemregen.co slash Dave. That's stemregen.co slash Dave. Over the last about three years now, um, I've tested the 0.6 to 0.8 grams and said, you know, I think it has to be nonsense uh, because of this carbs versus protein thing. Uh, so I've been doing reliably one gram per pound of body weight yeah. uh, or a little bit more. And I also looked at my aging clock and the last, at the, the end of my 0.6 to 0.8 kind of things uh, based on my longevity book, I was at 0.69 for my rate of aging. And, you know, we say, do those matter? Do those not? That would this put, is the need, do need and pace? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Do need and pace. It's part of the true age. My audience, most of them heard the episode on the true age test. So just to figure out, it's like, hey, I, I need a metric. It's better than telomeres. Sure. And they have about 20 other metrics for aging. Then I'm tracking, I'm going to do a big post on that, um, that I've done. Things like pulse wave and uh, P300D. Like There's all kinds of things that are like correlated with age. Right. They don't cause it, but they show, is the ultimate output of your system like a young person or an old person? Right. So um, looking at all that, um, after three years of absurdly high, you know, 200 grams of animal protein every day, <laughs> my rate of aging is 0.72, which is the same as Brian Johnson's on his non-vegan diet, because he's eating 20 grams of collagen protein every day, which comes from cows. 
So I have no idea what Brian Johnson. Well, doing. I mean, yeah. I, com- I completely ignore that whole thing. I, I actually I interviewed him. He's he's <laughs> he's a a very fun person to to talk with because he's so unusual. Yeah, right. I don't agree well, with I, everything. And I'm but, not yeah. trying to bash yeah. him. Look, I like uh, the fact that he is making his data available yeah. to people. I think oh, yeah. that's great. Uh, I do too. I. I just, it's, there's a lot of noise. Well, there's a lot of noise. And also, you know, we're all biologically unique. And so, like for me, I haven't published my list of 150 supplements that I take, right? And the reason for that is that I don't want people copying me. I have people who worship the ground I walk on. And guys, could you stop? Like, I, I'm a knowledgeable guy and I'm inspirational, all that stuff. But you didn't used to weigh 300 pounds, have autoimmune conditions and all the weird stuff that I did. And you don't need excessive amounts of B6 and zinc and biotin genetically the way I do. So if you do what I do, you'll probably at best shit your pants. And at worst, you'll feel like crap for a couple of weeks. Like, so we have to customize this to you and I'm working on tools for you. But, and you, you must see this in your, in uh, Opta, Opta Span because you know, some people come in and this person just needs a couple things. So Absolutely. I don't want to do what a guru does. I want to do what, I don't want to do the things the guru does for the reasons the guru does them. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I, I, I like to uh, emphasize is whenever possible, I think biomarkers are where it's at, yeah. for sure. And whenever possible, measure, intervene, and measure again. In other words, you want to know where you're at Mm-hmm. You want to know whether whatever the intervention is that you're doing is working and 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 you want to get yourself into what we think is the optimal range. And too many people, I think, just start randomly doing stuff. They don't ever measure in the first place. Yeah. Right. And I and I think that's that's something that um can can be okay, but can also get you in trouble. It can. And I'll say, look, if you have very little money, taking, you know, vitamin Dake and D A K N E. It's probably better than not doing anything, even if you don't have a blood test. Sure. Like, but the blood tests are not that expensive. So again, this is, this is I think... Hold on. Half of households in the US don't have $1,000 to spend on emergency expenses right now. Like Biden has stripped our currency by just printing a lot of dollars. So for some people, a $50 vitamin D test really is a lot. Sure. And so if... And a lot of people listening are in that situation right now and they're, they're saying, well, how many supplements versus the quality of my beef? So it, it's like, yeah, if you're I, there, don't get the test and do the lowest cost thing that's likely to move the needle and hope, but I sure want you to get the test. <laughs> I think that's fair. Look, I, I'm, I think we could go down a whole rabbit hole on healthcare disparities of which yeah. there are many and they are real and it sucks. That's the reality of the world we live in. Uh, yes, if you absolutely cannot afford the test, you're probably better off being probabilistic and saying there's a chance, a good chance I'm deficient, take the supplement. Yeah, I think a lot of people who claim they can't afford the test actually don't know how much the test cost and could stop going to Starbucks and getting yeah. their $10 coffee every yeah, day. Yeah, just don't, uh, skip, two, <laughs> skip two drinks or right. one night a week and you'll right. be fine. I, I agree with you. People allocate things differently. Okay, so anyways, okay. <laughs> we were talking about rapamycin and dogs. Yeah, we, so we are, but that's because you're, you're a broad spectrum knowledgeable <laughs> longevity guy, so I'm having fun with you. Um, talk to me about triad. Yeah, so, uh, so, so rapamycin, we know from the... Uh, preclinical literature and laboratory animals, it seems to affect biological aging across the evolutionary spectrum. And it occurred to me again, this was probably 2013, 2014, that, that there were actually several things we knew could increase lifespan and health span in mice. And those things almost certainly would work in dogs. And I've been a dog person my entire life. And I suddenly realized, holy crap, I could probably extend the lifespan of my dog and other people's dogs, yeah. but we need a way to actually test it. And so that's how Triad evolved was as really um, an effort to do a rigorous double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial in dogs to answer the question, does rapamycin increase lifespan and improve health span metrics in dogs? And so we designed the trial. It took about, took about five years to get funding to actually do that trial. And then we started enrolling dogs, and it's happening right now. Any preliminary data you can share? Yeah, so we've, we've done two, uh, what we really uh, thought of as safety trials. So these were shorter term. So one, the first one was 10 weeks. The second one was six months. Uh, again, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Um, so, so a few things I can say with certainty. So we did not see any significant adverse events in any of the trials to date. So we're pretty confident that rapamycin, at least at the doses we're testing, can be used safely in dogs. Um, we found 
statistically significant improvements in two measures of age-related heart function, both okay. left ventricular function. That was done by echocardiogram in the rapamycin-treated dogs compared to placebo. And in both trials, uh, there were increases in owner-reported activity. So a little bit weaker kind of data because this was owner-reported, but Again, the owners were blinded. So they didn't know if their dog was getting rapamycin or placebo. So I think, we again, we can be pretty confident about safety. And there's some evidence for improvements. I don't know anything about the outcomes from the big trial now from Triad because that trial is still blinded. Um, it looks like you guys designed it to detect a 9% change in lifespan. Yeah, so it was originally designed to detect a 15% change in lifespan. That was 230 dogs. And then... Uh, a few years ago, a group of uh, donors came together. Peter Atia actually put this together, cool. um, along with Tim Ferriss and a couple of others, to increase the size of the study to 580 dogs, it's worth which it. gives us the 9%. Yep. So 40 to 110 pounds, you basically want big dogs, at least yep. seven years old. What about guys who like little dogs who think they're big? <laughs> yeah. So this gets back to the idea that... Um, Big dogs age faster than small dogs do. So in order to have that statistical power, uh, we needed to have dogs that were aging more rapidly and already in middle age in order to be able to see uh, an effect on lifespan within the three-year window of the trial. All right. Uh, and humans taking rapamycin. I mean, I've done it on and off. Do you take it? I am right now, yeah. So How I, often and what I, does? I, I tend to cycle rapamycin. I, I've done um, typically 10 or 12-week cycles. And I'm honestly pretty non-scientific about it. I, uh, I take it when I feel like it or when, when you know, things in my life are lining up. But um, I've, I've done six milligrams a week, 10 milligrams a week, eight milligrams a week. So sort of in that range. The first time I ever took rapamycin was because uh, I was having a, a, some very severe shoulder pain. And after a long drawn out process, got it diagnosed as frozen shoulder or, or adhesive capsulitis. Right. So inflammation in the shoulder capsule. The doc really said there wasn't much that he wanted to do. Oh, so he much said, you can do. He said, go back, to, go back to physical therapy and it might go away in a year. And I was just, you know, I was, I was horrified by that because I couldn't sleep, couldn't throw a ball with my kid. And I started thinking, you know, I, I, I know about <laughs> something that is really good at knocking down age-related inflammation. So I set up my own N of one experiment uh, six milligrams a week. And I had, you know, I planned from the very beginning that I would give it 10 weeks and see what happens. And within a couple of weeks, uh, there was a very significant reduction in pain. And by the end of the 10 weeks, I'd say 95% range of motion, almost no pain and hasn't come back. So for me, it was a very important kind of quality of life changing yeah. uh, experience. It, it drives me nuts because I was a biohacker and I see that I'm like, well, have they tried Shockwave? Have they hit it with ozone, which is very cheap, 150, 200 bucks, and surprising evidence for that. And then have they done um, hydrodissection? Have they done uh, all the stem cell things you could do or just exosomes? And there's all these things that don't take a year that affect quality of life. Yeah. But all of those, except maybe ozone, are more expensive than uh, rapamycin. So if you can knock it down with a pill, I'm all over that. I noticed when I went above six that I tended, because it's immunosuppressant, I tended to get more uh, like colds and things like that. Hmm. I, I typically don't get them very often. I'm, yeah. I'm very robust now. I used to get them all the time yeah. when I was younger. But uh, so I guess that there's a dance there that you have to do based on, you know, the states of your mast cells, whether you have a long coat fit or your mold exposure. Like I, I, I think did, there's or, a lot of individual variation yeah. just in both uptake of rapamycin and the rate at which it is cleared. So we know that rapamycin is metabolized by something called the cytochrome P450 uh -huh. family, which is also involved in a lot of drug metabolism. So some people are just faster metabolizers than others. Uh -huh. So I think there's a very, and this is where, unfortunately, we just don't have much good data um, on individual sort of responses to off-label use of rapamycin. I have a question about the dog study that just popped into my head. Are you tracking whether the owner of the dog is a couple versus a man versus a woman? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think the, the answer is yes, but in, indirectly. So we do get information about a uh, number of people in the household. Okay. So we get both number of adults, number of kids, and other animals. I don't think we ask ever about... Uh, you know, spousal relationship or anything like that in any of our, our data. It's more what sex are the people I'm thinking about. Oh, yeah, we get that. Yeah. 
it's it'd be interesting to look at whether there's uh, there's any information in that because you might have seen the studies that show when a woman feeds the lab mice, they get an entirely oh, right. different stress yeah, response than absolutely. men. Absolutely, there's this pheromone thing going on. Yeah. yeah, super super interesting there. Yeah, for that matter too, if a woman in the house with a dog is on birth control versus not on birth control, we would know. What's going on uh, with the confounding variables we just don't know about? AI should solve that for us in about three years. Uh, <laughs> Again, you're just, very optimistic. Well, it it's that my, my field is computer science, yeah. right? And understanding exponential growth, uh, we still don't think of it well as humans, but this isn't exponential. This is an exponential of an exponential right now. So when you go really deep on that stuff, you just realize the world's going to look really different yeah, every year so. going yeah. forward. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll both have jobs. And I'm pretty sure <laughs> that next year we'll both be sitting at home and it'll look like we're in an interview yeah. right here. I mean, the stuff that's coming down is crazy. I'm in the, the very late stages of creating an AI that has every word I've ever spoken, every, mm. every research paper I've ever used, um, and all of my books. And this is 1,200 interviews on my show and probably another 1,000 on other people's shows, yeah. um, along with a bunch of other research so that when people come in and say, I want to do what Dave does, I'm like, no, no, no. Do what Dave would recommend, right? Based on all yeah, of these interviews, right. what would Dave's guest recommend? Right. And then um, it's even down to the point of saying, well, how much energy do you have to invest? Like, how much suffering are you willing to endure? <laughs> right? Because some things are harder than others, sure. right? Are you going to tap in your bone marrow the way I did a couple times? Probably not, right? <laughs> and then how much time uh, and how much money are you willing to, to put in? And what is your goal? So that's ultimately where health span and life extension end up. If your goal is a healthy health span and you want to look a certain way, your recommendations are going to be different than someone who says, I don't care how I look, make me live twice as long, right? Or I want to be, you know, I want to be the brain from Pinky and the Brain. Okay, like totally different set of, of supplements and totally... And I think we're there with our knowledge, but our ability to filter and sort the knowledge. You've you've studied for I don't twenty know. plus I mean, years. I, I, I think I think you've got a you've got more confidence in the quality of the data that's out there than than I do. I, I'm I, I have done enough uh, scientific research in a lab and seen enough data from other people to be pretty skeptical about the quality of oh. a lot of the data that we've got. And so my worry is that yes. And AI could come to answers based on those data, but are they going to be the right answers or not? So we actually agree violently on that one. Um, <laughs> the was, was it the chief of the British Medical Journal just said, we've reached a crisis point. You cannot reproduce most of the studies that are out there because of corruption. Yeah, I don't know that it's because of corruption. That I would push back on Probably a little bit. Probably ad-libbing that part, but he says because of special interests or... or I think there's all sorts of reasons yeah. why there's noise in the scientific literature. There's some Absolutely. corruption, no question about it. Um, some of it is just the biology is so complicated that, that you know, and, and the effect sizes are within the margin of error. There's a lot of bad statistics. Oh, yeah. And there's some just, you know, bad training. I mean, I, I see this in my field, right? You can you can follow people who were, who were not trained to do rigorous science, who don't yeah. do controls, who intentionally misinterpret, or they don't even realize they're intentionally doing it. They've been trained to leave out data that doesn't fit the model. So I think there's a lot of reasons. It's not, it's not intentional corruption in many cases, but the 100%. end result is the same. It, it's also just human biases. You know, the, the journal of, um, of failure is essentially what we need. And there's a few yeah. people working on that. Say, so here's all the studies that didn't work that wouldn't be published so we could know it doesn't work. Right. Yeah, that, that would be extremely valuable, I think, if we could somehow capture all of that data in one place. And then, you're, then I would agree with you. Then the computational approaches, the new AI tools, could in fact query that data. Yeah. And I think... Even if there's a lot of noise, if you've got a large enough data set, these tools can tease out the signal. Oh yeah. My worry is that that at this point, there's um, so much in there that's that's just not right. Oh yeah. We're going to end up at wrong answers. Well, now you said something in there, a little nugget that's behind. It's one of the main reasons that I started the biohacking movement. If you have a large enough set of data, you'll get the truth. So the reason I'm happy about AI's ability to do this. It's not that AI is going to believe half the garbage that's out there. My AI, I actually only train it with studies that meet my standards, right? So I'm like overweight. 
the ones that actually make sense within all the frameworks we're working in. Understanding yeah. I have my own bias, but if you like my bias and my results are good, okay, fine. Maybe my bias is better than someone else's or not, right? Sure. So we'll end up in this world where we have competing sets of data. And you know, we might have, you know, you have your OptiScan set of, of data and principles and recommendations and your AI says, well, here's what we would do. Yeah. And then you get Peter Atia. He doesn't need AI. He's like, just exercise more and just that's all you can do. Come and, on, stop bashing Peter. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like it's just it's so fun. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm teasing him at this point. <laughs> oh, I forgot statins. You can do that too. There you go. <laughs> These are the most controversial things. Um, but he's going to have his own things. And he, he writes about yeah. mTOR and doesn't use testosterone, but recommends it for people. I've been on testosterone since I was 26 because my levels are lower than my mom. It seemed like a good idea. So you know, you you go through um, all these recommendations, and you're also going to have like these radical vegan doctors. Right. Okay. We all have our ability to make recommendations based on right. our perceptions and our analysis of what science is, quote, real. And then the AIs, though, you can tell them, hey, find all the studies that are in your training data that don't match with each other. Right. And then let's understand the mechanisms behind it. Yeah. And it's already capable of doing that. Yeah. Like I have worked with Chat GPT 4, which is not a great AI. Um, to design a new molecule to do something I wanted it to do. Like, this is crazy. I didn't have it manufactured because I, I have a lot of projects on my plate. But now I know how to do it. And you're going, this is incredible. Yeah. So I'm very hopeful. And my only concern is that we're going to just train them to like take money from other people, take attention from other people, and kill people we don't like. That would be wrong. So I'm working on on that side of making AI about human flourishing, uh, along with AI flourishing, instead of like human power. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's a fantastic uh, ideal, and I align completely with that. Uh, and, and I believe it's going to make your job as a PhD researcher and CEO of Optiscan easier Optiscan. and better. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> we are not scanning Optiscan. people's eyes. <laughs> Optiscan. All right, got it. Sorry. For some reason, those two words in my mind, I, when I say them, I see Although, it. Although, yeah. retinal scans, I think, are super interesting data type for health span oh, and, and potentially longevity production. I think your webcam and your Xbox camera on your eyes, it's an untapped part yeah. of, of biohacking. So we agree on that. Yeah. Just the, the ease and regularity of, of the way your eyes sweep tells you so much yeah. about the nervous system. I, most There's a lot know of cool that. stuff there. You, you know all the good stuff. <laughs> you also know about uh, something called the Million Molecule Challenge, yeah. which I'm a big fan of. Tell me what you're doing with that. The goal of the Million Molecule Challenge is very simple. It's to test a million interventions on longevity using the nematode C. elegans as our starting yep. point. And the reason for this, I think, first of all, in my mind, it's obvious, right? <laughs> we have only explored a tiny fraction of the intervention space, and we are absolutely going to find a whole bunch of extremely cool, large effect size stuff if we, if we screen a million interventions. But there's a bigger reason for this, which is that, in my view, the field, unfortunately, has n actually narrowed over the last 15 years instead of expanded. And I think the hallmarks of aging, which I like as, a, as an artificial construct, have contributed to this. So the hallmarks of aging, I know you know, but in case, in yeah, case your, your viewers don't, um, are a set of originally nine, now 12, uh, aspects of biological aging that a group of people in the field have um, settled on as being the core mechanistic features of aging. Yeah. And they include things like your favorite telomere shortening, right, right. Uh, senescent cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, deregulated nutrient signaling. I could probably get 10 of them. I won't get In all 12. Intracellular, <laughs> extracellular junk, cellular stiffening, yeah. loss of stem cell volume. Uh, yeah. There's there's the three yeah. new ones, dysbiosis, right? And, uh -huh. uh, I don't remember what the other. Yeah, that, those didn't exist when, when I wrote my book. I had seven, and, that was, and then nine, yeah. and 12, and they'll probably be 18 next year. Right. So that's the point, though, is that I think the... Um, the adoption of the hallmarks so broadly by the field has sort of forced people to think about their research within that context. And it has become very, very difficult for people to think outside of the hallmarks or maybe more importantly, get funded to do research outside of the hallmarks. And so the consequence of that is nobody is really doing the, the large scale discovery science at this point to find what don't we know. That's really the the, the point of the million molecule challenge is to say, okay, let's not pretend like we completely understand the biology of aging. Let's go find out what we don't understand. And if and and in my view, if we're going to do that, the thing you want to do is you want to be able to look at scale. So you need technology that allows you to look for 
interventions that have a big effect at scale, and we've created that. And you probably want to use lifespan as the endpoint you're looking for because that is what we're most interested in. But I thought you couldn't extend lifespan. You can absolutely extend lifespan. Don't tell Peter. <laughs> I'm just messing with you at this point. Yeah. No, I mean, look, we've been able to successfully extend lifespan in every animal where we've tried. There's no reason to think humans are any different. Now, you created something called the worm bot. Yeah. Which makes me happy. And and listeners might remember uh, the company behind a peptide called OS01 that apparently reverses um, cell aging in skin. Um, They looked at something like 600... Uh, different potential interventions using skin on a chip, basically, to figure out what worked. So one relatively small company looked at 600 things and found one that worked. Right. And you're saying, well, all of the companies here, and you're providing the tool, this worm bot, which is essentially the, I guess there's some biology from nematodes on a chip? Like, how does the worm bot No, no, work? so the worm bot is actually, doesn't involve a chip at all. Um, so this is this is using kind of the standard, at least currently, the standard conditions people have always used for aging studies in worms. These are nematode worms. They're about a millimeter in size, so yeah. tiny, crawling around on the surface of a plate, and they eat bacteria as their food. So in the old days, people had to sit it in a microscope. Right. And, and in fact... Um, as the worms get older, they slow down. So it's kind of funny. You actually use a wire pick and you tap them on the head to see if they're still alive. So oh it's God. sort of like hitting a person with a telephone pole to see if they're still alive. It's hit forever, <laughs> too. Oh, my God. So, yeah, so it's extremely time intensive. So we just created a robot that um, has a camera attached to it, and it takes yeah. pictures of the worms over their entire lifespan every 10 minutes. And then we use AI to interpret those pictures Beautiful. and tell us, are the worms still moving? If so, how much? How fast? Are they still alive? So wow. it's all automated. So it takes us from being able to do, you know, a couple dozen experiments in a year to a couple hundred thousand in a year. And it's sort of infinitely scalable. So, you know, a million is just a big number. There's re- no reason you couldn't do 5 million or 10 million. How much does it cost to have a worm bot? Yeah, so the worm bot itself uh, probably only takes a few hundred dollars to build in parts. Obviously, there's people required to do it. The the AI tools are a little bit more sophisticated, but it's nothing that a computer science major couldn't couldn't do. It was like a quarter, um, a quarter million bucks to do the the million molecule challenge. Just to, to build out all the like, if I want to run in my living room, I got space. There. <laughs> if you wanted to build a wormbot factory, which is yeah. what so this is so we didn't talk about this. Aura Biomedical is the company we O-R-A, spun out of my right. lab. O R A. It's the it's the Rapa Nui word for health and vitality. So uh, is the company we spun out of my lab to do this at scale. And so the goal there is to build a, uh, an army of about forty wormbots and use that army to assess the effect of a million interventions on longevity. If you made a t-shirt that said Wormbot Army, I would pay 50 bucks for it to support your research. You got it. <laughs> in fact, maybe that's what we should do. So if people are interested in learning more, uh, you can go to the Aura Biomedical website. There's a, um, a video there where I talk about this in a little bit more detail. You can also actually sponsor an intervention. So we have a leaderboard. I don't know if it's up yet. I think it's now up where people can sponsor interventions. You can pick your own. Or you can just let the let the computer randomly pick them for you, and then you get your data back, right? And so the goal here is actually to do a service for the field, even though it's a for-profit company. The goal is to create a database of at least tens of thousands of interventions that people have sponsored to make that open access so that people can use the AI tools to query that database and find new things, right? So th- I think there's just so much potential here. This is so cool. See, yeah. that, that's a contribution to the field Absolutely. in a big way. I, thank you for doing that. So believe me, this is a source of immense frustration to me as I tried hard to get this funded on the academic side and just couldn't do it. And, it. and finally, it got to a point where I was just so frustrated that I'm like, okay, we got to take this outside of academia or it's never going to happen. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking I would definitely fund um, glyphosate. As a, as of course, if it had you, a huge you know negative, what? if it had a huge negative effect, that might <laughs> well, be useful so data. So actually, I, it's interesting. <laughs> I'll give it to RFK. So some things. So this is. I'll tell you a, a an interesting. I don't know if it's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of amusing to us. So when we first started doing, we built the wormbot in my lab at the University of Washington, and we first started doing a little bit of uh, of screening. And um, of course, we find things that shorten lifespan. We find more things that shorten yeah. lifespan than extend. One of the first things that we found, we were looking at some FDA approved drugs. And this was actually, this was probably 2021, maybe. So we were kind of still in the, in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It might have even been 2020. In fact, it, it was because it, it was before the election. Um, and uh, we found this thing that shortened lifespan to like half a day. 
we looked at it and it was ivermectin. And we were like, I'm well, glad that didn't extend lifespan. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, for nematodes, you would expect it to. But that's that's exactly what it's for. Right. So we're going to own the market on anti-helminthic drugs, right? We're going to find all right. sorts of stuff that shorten lifespan in worms. I was laughing because I am a sheep farmer. And we have a bunch of ivermectin. You give it to the sheep because the nematodes make them sick. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it was actually a nice uh, sort of positive control that, that we had in there. And, and of course, you didn't have to enter the land of controversy That's by right. saying... Oh I was God. just thinking, do I have to publish a paper that says that ivermectin extends lifespan and slows aging? That would be... Um, it would have made headlines. I will, I I will know, give it that. I do know some people who believe it probably does, most likely by reducing the effect of parasites that we don't know. Sure, have. right. And that... Yeah. I mean, again, that's plausible. Yeah, I'm certainly not recommending people start taking ivermectin. I, I think finbendazole is a much better drug for yeah, that. Yeah, that's for, interesting For too. longevity. Yeah, I yeah. take that every three months. Huh. I do a course of finbendazole yeah. because before you get to the seven, nine, or 12 hallmarks of aging, you get to don't die. And if you look at the big four killers, that's what I call them. Um, others call them four pillars, but um, it's cancer is one of the big four. And sure. It looks like fenbendazole has a very meaningful reduction in cancer in humans, but it is an anti-parasitic for dogs. It's not approved for humans. Yeah. I, I, I should go back and look. I know that, so I personally sponsored a bunch of molecules, and I, I know fenbendazole was one of them, but I think it was in combination with something else. You know all the cool stuff. We should it. have yeah. that data, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, this is really fun to talk with you because sometimes people will come in and they're not PhD researchers yeah. like you. I'm not a PhD researcher. I'm a researcher, but <laughs> it, PhD researchers are overrated. Believe me. <laughs> you know, it depends on what you know. What you researched, but it, it's cool. You know the little corners where yeah. you know I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect most people to do that, and it's because you're working with um, really three different uh, of the most important markers. You're looking at the early stage, which is nematodes. And then you're looking at dogs, and you're looking at people, yeah. and you actually have active projects in each one. So I think you have a different view than almost anyone I've met. I've made a, a, a dedicated effort to try to be broad, which, you know, I think that the flip side of that is I can't be deep on too many things. Yeah. But And it's interesting. And, and, and to me, this is a source of a little bit of, of, I don't know, frustration is not the right word, anxiety maybe, that, you know, 10 years ago, I felt like I had a pretty good grasp of everything that was happening in the field. I don't you feel can. that way anymore. It's it's growing so much, which is great. Like I, you know, I am I am, you know, passionately a believer that we need to do this and that growth in the field is a good thing. Um, but it has made it harder for me to really keep up with a lot of the cutting edge stuff. This is something that that deserves a little conversation here because I think it's affecting you and it's affecting a lot of listeners. In the early, early days of the internet and the web. Um, back when I'm doing that e-commerce thing, uh, there was a time where I knew every website, every single website, because there was only five, and then there was 10, and then there was 100, and it grew. And I went through this period of, of crisis, and I'd say I was about 23, because I would stay up later and later. I'm like, There's so much new knowledge and information, right. and I was trying to scale my knowingness of my digital environment with my time. Yeah. And eventually, I was truly... Uh, I think I was an information addict, what they call email addiction, or now it's just you know mobile phone addiction. Uh, and I had a problem with it. And just understanding that there is no way any human, even the very smartest and best of us, is going to know everything online right now. Yeah. And besides, half of what's online is garbage anyway. So the only thing we can do is learn to be comfortable and not stressed with that. Right. Because the stress will kill you. And I think recognize your limitations, right? And that's, I think, where a lot of people fall down is they they don't recognize what they don't know yeah. and get themselves in trouble. And I try hard. We all do that. Look, sure. I, I, but I try hard to be very humble about my lack of knowledge and, and recognize that there's way more that I don't know than I do, even about aging. Even about aging. And it's also important then, um, and a big thing that I look at, at my job is really is to curate knowledgeable people who have a good view of the future and and have different sets of of visibility into into practices and all that, so that listeners can come in and say, "All right, that that feels like a good direction," because the network of all the guests who've been on the show is, is hundreds of thousands of times more knowledge than I sure, have. Even right. I'm pretty knowledgeable, so it's like, how do we curate? Eventually, it'll be the best the best experts like you, and the best AI tool sets. Because there will be millions of different AIs that believe different things over the next <laughs> couple of years. So, That's pretty interesting to think about. <laughs> yeah, how do, how do we filter that, yeah. right? And it turns out the best filter 
that your biology is a filter of reality, right? It's throwing out a bunch of data before it hits your brain. Well, we need to build systems that throw out data before it hits our brains. And that's as important to longevity as having a dog. <laughs> because yeah. Otherwise, you're just like, I'm constantly bombarded. Yeah. I can't sleep. Yeah. And then that stress takes away your life. Yeah. I think the, the real challenge right now, as you've sort of alluded to, is the massive amount of information out there and sifting the signal from the noise. And particularly the signal that's right for you is, is really, really tough. I think a lot of listeners are going to be extremely interested in getting their dogs in. And I should mention my, uh, my assistant uh, here in Austin, her dog, Dadum, is in An awesome study. name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really cool name for a dog. It's because she was in the Coast Guard. And uh, she was saying, Dave, the amount of information they were gathering was insane. So I, kudos for getting all the info you can. Can people listening enroll their dogs to support your project? Yeah, so the, the project website is dogagingproject.org. There's a little button. I think it's up in the upper right-hand corner that says nominate my dog. You click that. It asks like five real simple questions, and then you will get invited to your owner, owner portal, okay. which is where you get access to the comprehensive annual survey. And that's called the Health and Life Experiences Survey. So I'm sure that's what she was referring to. And it is it is pretty comprehensive. So it takes people about an hour to two hours, depending on sort of the branching trees that they go down to complete the survey. Fortunately, it's in 10 modules. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. Um, and then once you've done that, you are part of the Dog Aging Project pack. Cool. And you are a community science participant contributing to healthy longevity in dogs, and healthy longevity in people. So it's a super fun project. Um, some of the dogs will be eligible for what we call sampled cohorts. So 10,000 dogs get their genome sequenced. 1,000 dogs are moved into what we call the precision cohort, where every year you get sent a sample kit that, that you take to your veterinarian to collect blood for epigenome, metabolome, fecal microbiome, things like that. So we get a comprehensive data set on 1,000 dogs every year. Um, this is a longitudinal study. So we aren't asking, unless you go into the clinical trial, which is triad, which we talked about, that's only 580 dogs. Okay. Everyone else is in the longitudinal study of aging. We don't ask the owners to do anything different than they normally would, but we collect data and in a subset of cases, biological samples, really to try to understand, again, what are the most important environmental genetic factors that influence health outcomes and longevity in dogs? Beautiful. Matt, thanks for asking the hard questions for many years. You're the only guest I've had out of almost 1,200 who's done real meaningful work across all of the different models uh, for aging, <laughs> including you. the human models. Uh, and I think that's unique and interesting. And cat people, uh, I'm sorry, um, but it seems like cats reproduce so quickly, they don't have to live longer. Is, is that... <laughs> I actually think there should be a cat aging project, there, there but be. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking, we kind of finished the interview, but uh, we were we were talking before it started that, that one of the problems is it's really hard to get a cat to take a pill. Right. Yes. I, I often get asked the question, uh, you know, why isn't there a cat aging project? Specifically in the context of the rapamycin trial. Why aren't you testing rapamycin in cats? And first of all, I'm a dog person. That is the honest answer. But have you ever tried to get a cat to take a pill? Because the oh, owners yeah, give the dogs their pill every week. Uh, and so it is just much more practical to think about designing this kind of a clinical trial in dogs. And here's, a, here's something for the cat owners. Cats tend to live longer than dogs. So again, yeah. thinking about the statistics of how long do you have to do the trial? How many dogs do you need? It would be harder to do that in cats. But I do think it is important to mention that there's no biological reason why rapamycin is going to work any differently in cats than it does in dogs mm -hmm. or in people. Than it does in dogs. You know, you're reminding me of an episode, probably in the first 300. I interviewed a veterinarian who was looking at the effects of MCT oil yeah. on health and longevity mm -hmm. in dogs and cats. Yeah. And I've been suggesting ever since then, you know, add a little MCT to your cat food or your dog food and right. watch your dog's food cravings go away. And they, they will eat less poop too. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Just because I think their energetics are better. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things do apply to both, but not everything. Sure. So. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 